All right, you in there? I All right, so. should be fine. Okay, let's do this. Just pull up my feed right here. You good? Need anything to drink, I'm John? I'm good. We got tons of water All right. in front of me. I've got <laughs> yep. all the hydration. There's stuff the off camera I could grab very yep. quickly. All right, awesome. All right, here we go. Let's get into the show. What's going on, guys? I'm Jake the Lawn Kid. Welcome back to another episode of Lawn Fires, where the fires are hot, the lawns are green, and the questions are engaging. Thanks to all of you for coming back for yet another episode. So for those of you guys who are new here, basically what this is, is it's a weekly show that I do Friday nights, 6 to 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, Fireside. And what I do in the duration of this show is I take your comments and all of your questions and I answer them live in real time. Now, for those of you guys who have never um, used YouTube Live before, let me just go ahead and walk you through it real quick. When you want to ask me a question, all you do is you come below the video here. You're going to see a couple of icons. There's going to be one that says live, more like a messenger icon. Click that one, and then you'll have access to this bar right here that will show you all the chats that are coming in. There's a search bar where you can type your question, and I will get to that at some point in the show. So with all that being said, um, another thing I wanted to mention here is that um, I do have a special guest joining me tonight, John Pajak of Turf Tamer Lawn Care. How you doing, John? Doing great. How you doing, Welcome Jake? to the show. Thanks. So, I think John's going to be a very, uh, a very good uh, asset to the show tonight because we're actually going to touch on a couple of topics tonight throughout the show. One of them being the end of the season because him and I are Hoosiers at heart. And one problem that we deal with here once we get into November is trying to find that perfect time to say, okay, when do I stop mowing in my business, right? And I think this is also very important for some of my DIY friends out there because some of you guys who mow lawns, who mow your own lawn, you might run into a situation where you're like, okay, I'm in the fall time right now, but when should I be looking for that perfect time to stop? So that's what we're going to touch on tonight. But for the most part, this show is really driven by you guys. Anything goes. So type in the comments, and we will be answering all of your questions. So with all that being said, let's get into the show. Okay, so um, let's see who's come in yet. Um, nobody's really come in yet, so I figure while anybody, um, I figure while all the questions come in, we can talk about that one thing in particular. Like how do we know, John, when in particular that we should stop mowing? Up here in northwest Indiana, a lot of times, uh, the grass never stops growing up here. Through the winter, it just slows down to a snail's pace. Mm -hmm. And I find that once you start getting into the really hard frosts, you know, it could be the end of October, it could be mid-November, it's, it's a crapshoot. There's been two, I, th I believe 2017 and 2018, I was still mowing some lawns and doing cleanups all the way into December. You know, it was it was weird. <laughs> it was really <laughs> weird because we still had lawns. They weren't growing that much every week, but you know, it was like, oh, we went from a weekly to a bi-weekly schedule just to keep them maintained and to keep them clean uh, because, you know, if you let, even after you do a cleanup, if you allow a lot of leaf matter to blow in from wherever it could be a, a nearby lot or a forest preserve or the neighbors cleaned up yep. if you get it all uh, a, a heavy coating of leaves there uh it'll mat down and that just opens up breeding ground for fungus and pests and other things that we have to repair in the springtime um so for myself I'd like to answer that question though uh it, it really depends on the weather the and the ground temperatures because once the ground temperatures start to get to that freezing point and they maintain that freezing point, I try to stay off the lawn as much as possible because when those uh, crowns of the, uh, of the grass freeze, it's very easy to damage them because the water that's inside the grass plant right. is frozen. Yeah. So when it's crystal, you, you step on it, mm -hmm. it would crystallize and it would break. You're crushing the foundation. You're crushing the foundation. Mm -hmm. And then you would get like either round footprints or if you took a mower across it, you could you would actually see the tire marks mm -hmm. from the uh, from the machine. And it's not going to, most of the time, it, it'll bounce back. But if it's done excessively, it could really damage your lawn. And you, that's something we don't want to do. 
Absolutely. Now, to touch on that last part that uh, John talked about, about the tire marks, I've seen that a lot in different parts of the season, not only the winter, but also the summer. Like when, when the lawns go into dormancy for two weeks and then you get rain that comes back to uh, water the lawn heavily, which is always a must here in the summer. If you're not getting it, your lawn is definitely suffering. Um, but I have noticed periods in, say, the summer and or winter where this would happen, where we'd get cold or hot and dry for a certain amount of time and the mowing crew would just be coming every week. And then once we get some, walk, some warmth or, or hydration, if you will, back to the plant, you notice that those areas where the tire marks weighing down, those areas suffer more than others. Yeah, and that's why a lot of times in the summertime, that's the only time that I ever worry about the lawn being dormant and then damaging it. Because right. with the, you know we got mostly Kentucky bluegrass, perennial rye up here. Um, we do have some fescue lawns, but eh, few and far between. But uh, you know, like you said, in the summertime, we go through those dormant periods and drought type conditions yep you can really <laughs> you can accentuate that lawn with some permanent stripes if you're not careful mm -hmm. that's a that's actually another problem that uh, i see a lot of first time business owners making i've made it myself where we'll actually mow our lawns the same pattern over and over and over every week yeah. that's something that you don't want to do no. because when you do that what you're doing is you're training the lawn to lay in that same direction all the time, which may not seem like a problem, but you need to realize that when, it, it's kind of like your hair, right? When you're combing your hair to stay in one direction, that's fine. But with your lawn, the problem you're, you're sacrificing or the problem you're having per se, is when you keep mowing it in that same direction, you're pushing the lawn more and more in that direction. Right. You're varying your mowing patterns like we tell you to, it's being trained to stand up straight, which is what we want. And to go back to that laying over, when it's laying over, what can happen is, you know, you're blocking sunlight to more turf underneath, things are thinning out, fungus is building up, all sorts of problems. It's just not a pretty situation. So the lesson of the day here would be make sure that you figure out when it's appropriate to be on the lawn. Make sure it's warm and wet, not cool and dry, or really what? Just make sure that the lawn is soft before you walk on it, and on top of that, Make sure that your mowing. <laughs> I love that. Um, make sure that uh, just make sure that you're varying your mowing patterns as much as you can. You should yeah. be fine. I mean, I, I I know for the properties that we maintain that we that we mow, it, we will do like eight different uh, directions before we come back. Mm -hmm. And even when we come back to, let's just say, and what I mean by that is, you know, one week would be north south, one would be east west, and yep. the, the uh, angles. But then even when we go back to that pattern of like north south, mm -hmm. we'll stagger it, the wheels, just a little bit. So like we would end up being in the middle of that pattern where instead of like going off the sidewalk all the time, we'll stagger it and that way we don't there's no hit. Mm. Um, and that that tip I'll give to your followers because here in Northwest Indiana in the springtime this year, <laughs> you remember how wet it was. We, were, we had standing water for a very long time. Uh, a lot of lawns were not draining off because we had like 27 days of rain in May out of, out of 31. <laughs> it was some ridiculous amount. Yeah. <laughs> so we had to do that in order to get everything cut and to maintain it because it's growing like six to eight inches a week almost. It was ridiculous. Um, besides doing the alternate patterns, we would also stagger the way the mower would hit the lawn. That mm -hmm. way we would not run it up. That's very smart because I actually recommended that in one of my project lawn videos that I did a couple of weeks ago. I don't know if you've uh, been following along, John. I'm sorry. Uh, if, you're not, if, you're not, if you're not, it's yeah. all good. I understand. You're a hustler, man. I yeah. appreciate what you do. But I have this uh, big project lawn I'm doing up the street. Uh, it's one of my dad's friends from high school. Sure. It's about 30,000 square feet. And the one problem that he has to contend with, and all of you guys who are watching this right now, I'm sure a majority of you know what I'm talking about. This lawn has like a really steep slope on the side of it, right? Is it the new development right over here? Uh, no, it's actually right up. You know where Lake Hills is? Yeah. So right across from there, there is a, there's like this woodland area. Yeah, he I know, lives I know in, exactly. Yeah, he lives in one of the houses gotcha. over there. And he's got like a really long driveway, goes deep into the woods, and he's got five acres, an acre of that is turf. It's my neighborhood. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, there's like this giant slope, uh -huh. and because of that, he's really limited on what he can do with limiting his mowing patterns, right? He right. can't 
he can't really go side to side one week and up and down the other. It's just too steep to do that. Sure. So what he'll do is he'll mow with the slope. He'll go around the house and he'll go 45 like this. And he'll mm. just go around the entire house because that's how the uh, grass loops. Sure. So one thing I recommended to him because he's very limited is, okay, I understand you can't change your mowing patterns, but maybe change your overlap every other mowing. Yep. So maybe do like tire to tire one mowing and then do like 50% the other. Now for those of you guys who, um, for those of you guys who want a little bit more of an illustration, basically what I told them was make sure that the tire marks from the previous pass are literally border to border with the tires of the previous and then maybe um, every second or third week you, you add a 50% overlap just to make sure that you're not putting too much undue stress on those exact same spots. Would right. you agree? Yeah, because if you keep going over the same areas, it's going to wear thinner. Oh, yeah. And you you will literally have a little bit of a rut. You know, if you look at it a certain way and you catch the light, you will see the tires, and then you'll see a slightly higher point. And then when you do change the angle, you can scalp areas. Mm -hmm. Because now you've made depressions, and you'll know it, because when you're riding over it, <laughs> that thing will jack you back and forth a bit. Um, I've, I've seen that happen... Especially with like townhomes and things like that, where it's very it's limited again to how you cut it. You mm -hmm. know, it's more about efficiency. <laughs> when, you, when you have something like that, it's about efficiency, right? But if it's a really small thing, I've seen guys that just literally you know, they follow the same route every single time, and they you, you could tell when you walk in the lawn like where the, the tires go every single month, every week. Yep. So. Uh, and hillsides are a challenge too, so it's 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 hard to it's hard to vary it, especially mm -hmm. if if it's a homeowner and they have residential equipment. Uh, if they got like a belly mower, like probably like a riding mower like yep. that, that it, it's very difficult to change it up because um, not there's nothing wrong with them for homeowners. <laughs> yeah, but they will they. It's hard to maneuver those in, in the way that you need to. Absolutely, to I can agree with you there. Um, another problem that I ran, ran into, um, similar to what John was saying, is because I, I used to do this a lot in my first business years. I mean, come on, we've all, we've all made mistakes. So I've had properties down the street where I would just cut them in the same direction, mm -hmm. maybe two to three times in a row. And then after that, when I would cut it in a different direction, because the lawn would be so used to laying in that direction, I'm basically cutting it a little shorter than it's used to. Right. right? You, you kind of, what you'd end up doing is those parts that lay down, because you're putting them all in one direction, if you go the opposite way or you go in a different way, it'll lift those up again. And instead of taking the one third off, like where, you, you know, the proper, mm -hmm. uh, you know, maintenance yeah. procedure, you could potentially take off half or more yeah. because those, it all depends on how it's growing. Uh, it, I see that problem with uh, more along the lines of in fescue lawns, mm -hmm. where they'll they'll bend over um, with Kentucky blue and rye grass. They don't generally have that problem. Right. But when you have like a um, a shady lawn that has like the chewing fescues and the, you know, things like that, then those fine fine fescues those will definitely lay over mm -hmm. and, oh, yeah. and cause problems and then if you cut them in the wrong or you cut them in a different direction mm -hmm. you're going to damage that plant a little bit or you're not going to damage it you're going to stress it out and, and it's going to not thrive as well as it could mm -hmm. i agree with you 100 percent. in fact to go back to those uh two different grass types there if there's one thing i like fescue for it's the fact that um, you do have the flexibility to either cut a tall or lower mm -hmm. and i say that because it's more of a rigid hardy type grass whereas bluegrass is more fine and flexible right it's easy to lay it over yeah it the blades are different um, with I like bluegrass I really I really like bluegrass oh, over bluegrass. it's my favorite mm -hmm. um, it's a it's a very hard once it's established it's a very hardy grass right and depending on what cultivar you have you know there's like a it's not just, yeah hey there's one <laughs> kind of bluegrass there are so many of them um, you could adapt different if you want a super dark lawn you could have a cer certain cultivar in there and then if you yeah. have like kids that are running around there it's awesome because if they turf you know if they knock a spot in the turf it'll self heal itself uh, one of the downfalls of fescues and like perennial 
rylons are that if you damage them, they're a bunch type grass, so they only grow in, in bunches, and they most cultivars of fescue do not have, they're not rhizo uh, they don't right. have rhizomes. Mm -hmm. They're bunch. They're bunch, and they won't repair themselves, so you have to repair them every season or so. Yep. Otherwise, they won't fill in. You see, one thing I preach to a lot of my followers, whether they're uh, professionals or homeowners, is I tell them not to stress seeding too much in the spring. Now, no. no. I play, no, I, I agree with you. Because I do a lot of that stuff on my channel. I like to just play around, have a little fun, experiment, yeah. because I, I have the experience and confidence to know that it's not going to hurt anything. But for a lot of my beginners out there, I don't, I don't recommend seeding in the spring, right? If anything, simple pre-emergent in the springtime, if you're, if you're able to do it, depending on the license that you have, and which we'll talk about a little bit here as well. Um, and then just pushing what you have there already with proper cultural practices, you know, right. proper mowing, proper irrigation, proper fertilization, which I've talked a ton about on my channel. And once you get to the fall time, whatever doesn't repair itself, you can fill in the gaps of the good fall overseeding. Right. I, I, and here, go ahead. I'm going to just stoke sure, the fire. sure, stoke the fire a little bit uh, to like the res. You know, anybody that's out there that uh, I, I encounter this a lot when people uh, try to hire me for the first time and they want to put seed down in the in the spring. And I've done it before, and I don't want to like promise <laughs> i can't guarantee the results with it so I, I always encourage people i say i don't think i and i i tell them i'm like i would love to take your money but i have to look at you in the face every day you know every time i come by so i always advise against their seeding in the spring and that's mostly you know in our, with our cool season grasses in the springtime they are competing heavily with with crabgrass germination that's going to pop up as soon as the, uh, the, the soil temperatures get to a certain temperature, right around 55 degrees. Uh, the broadleaf weeds, they're, they're just a, not a great growing um, environment for seed. Even though it, it is wet enough most of the time for that seed to germinate, it could germinate in that small time period, but then it's going to have the summer to contend with. And a lot of times, it doesn't root well enough to survive the heat and the drought condition in Northwest Indiana to survive. So when you end, you end up getting a little bit, you could do some spot seeding, and I, I have no problem with doing that because I, you, you know, if you're focusing on one area, it's easier to maintain it. But if you're looking to overseed or reseed an entire lawn, I would not. I advise all my clients not to do it until fall. Because when you do it in the late summer, I generally do it um, in late August, mid-August to September. And well, this year we probably could have done it in October, but I don't like doing that. But w because I, I like to plant uh, Kentucky bluegrass, I want to give it as much opportunity to germinate as possible. Oh, yeah. and, and with Kentucky bluegrass, you have it takes up to 28 days sometimes. For it to fully germinate and get a good root system in and um, what a lot of people don't understand too is that when if you try to seed and you throw down a pre-emergent mm -hmm. for crabgrass yep you just now made all that seed that grass seed that you paid a lot of money for it's not going to germinate mm -hmm. so there's a lot of cons to spring seeding it's to spring seeding up here I, I think that might be across the country but definitely in our region you, you don't want to do it. I, I no. think you could. I think with, I'm not a. I am not a warm turf specialist, so I can't really, you know, say it. But I think if they were going to seed, they the spring would be better off. Yes, absolutely. For for warm season. In fact, I've actually um, heard from a couple of professionals in the uh, warm season field that they actually prefer seeding in the spring if you're going to do it. Mm -hmm. Typically with Bermuda, um, because. It is warm season grass for a reason. It does better in warm it does better. So seeding in the spring as the temperatures trend up is a good thing. Mm -hmm. Now, for the most part, what I have heard from a couple of Florida friends too is that they actually don't recommend seeding. They recommend plugging if they will. It, yeah, they, they have totally different soils down there and they mm -hmm. have the different grasses that grow yeah. like uh, different like St. Everything. Like everything's different. 
I mean, I've had I've had offers to you know move down south and <laughs> and work or do do work for other people, and I'm like, I would have to literally learn a lot of things <laughs> over. I mean, I don't even, I'm getting old. I'm not, I don't know if I want to learn everything over again. You know what it is though. <laughs> Um, I was actually talking with Matt Martin the other mm-hmm. day. He told me, Jake, all, he, he literally told me like this, Jake, all it is just the opposite of cool season, right? Because yeah. the, the actual um, prime time for them is in the summertime. Sure. Whereas for us, it's spring and fall, mostly spring for us. Yeah. Um, because they don't do so well in cooler temperatures, but when it gets warmer and you're getting all that rain, it's jumping. Yeah. So that's how it is for them. But for us... It's the opposite. And to be honest, I kind of prefer ours. I like our. It's ours. Is, mm-hmm. I'm not saying it's easier, but it's man. It. I know what to expect in, a, in it with. That. I mean, it's just mainly because I grew up in this area. Right. And I, and I know. You, you know, cool season. I know cool season grass left and right. So, it. Um, we we're a little bit luckier too because we could. The herbicides that are on the market, um, for professional use, we can use more. We have more options mm-hmm. when it comes to treating cool season grasses as to warm season turf. And uh, some of the guys down south, I'm like, how do you, oh, oh, yeah, you got to use that stuff. Man, that's totally <laughs> <laughs> It's like, yeah, that's that's a challenge, isn't it? Yep. So, you got any questions there? Uh, Dan McCann, this is actually a good one because I run into these situations all the time. And I have my input that I give to people, which is just to go for your seating. But uh, I would also like your input as a professional. Um, so what do I do with a yard full of clover and crap and very little grass? The yard is so disgusting right now. I was hoping to do something with it in the spring. Do you want me to just fire off? Go ahead. If it's gener- Rule of thumb for us is if it's over 50% junk, I would do a total kill and do, this, do a, a whole receding. I wouldn't mess around with trying to spot spray or trying to... Uh, just save what's there because a lot of times when you have a lawn that is mixed with a lot of weeds, grass, uh, crabgrass, whatever, you not only that, but then you have, um, you may have like K31, which is, I hate that stuff. It's it's a cool season grass. It's a pasture grass. Mm-hmm. And they even sell it as a lawn grass. And it is not. It is a very... In my opinion, it's a, it's a total pasture grass. It has its it has its purpose, but in a home lawn, it looks terrible because it is like three times as thick, as, uh, the blade width is like three times as thick as a Kentucky bluegrass or even a perennial rye blade, yep. and it sticks out like a sore thumb. So the reason is to do a total kill is that way you clear out everything. You're starting from you're still going to have to combat weeds. Because when you're reseeding, you're still going to have weeds popping up in there, but uh, you're not going to have as many challenges. You could It's easier to fix things that way yep. than it is with the Frankenstein lawn. Yeah. In fact, to add uh, on top of what John's saying here, this is a little bit of a different approach. So, and I agree with you 100%, right? Mm-hmm. Complete kill off it's if it's 50%, but if it's a little less than 50%, more like 25% weeds with very little grass in there, tons of bare spots, then here's what I would recommend you do, especially if you're a homeowner or just a starting business owner. Go ahead and do your seeding, right? Especially if you're seeding with rhizomatous grass, like bluegrass, just know that eventually it's going to find its footing and it's going to start taking over, right? Because the idea at this point is if you don't have any viable turf, and you have a ton of bare spots, we want to get some viable turf in there, and then we can start thinking about the weeds later. Like once we get to the spring, maybe a pre-emergent to get rid of them, and on top of that, just nurture what's there, proper water, proper mowing, proper irrigation, all throughout the spring and summer, and then whatever doesn't fill in, you fill in the gaps next fall, and before you know it, beautiful lawn. Sure, that's the, the two different, they're both valid. Very, the, one, very, the one, the the only reason I suggest a total kill for a professional is because when somebody hires us, they expect results. They want results like yesterday. And <laughs> yeah. that, the problem is, it the lawn care it truly is a patient man's game. I am very patient, and I could wait for that thing to grow in and fill in. But most of my clients do not. They want that thing this summer. They they expect it to, to turn from 
the junk that they've got to right. like a golf course quality within three months. And I'm like, those expectations, I have to set that forward. We cannot do that. That is not, unless we, we could put sod in. I don't do sod, but I know some friends that do, you know, some other companies, they, they do sod. That, I'm like, if you want to do it with seed and with, uh, you know, proper, uh, you know, maintenance yep. or whatever, it's going to take longer. So you could, if you ha run into that, ask yourself that question, how patient are you? If you're very patient, then I would go ahead and do what Jake says and go ahead and throw some seed down, let it kind of fill in, feed it, nurture the soil. It's not always about the plant itself. You got to get that soil right. You're gonna, you know, exactly, you, gotta right? get, you, you can't grow good plants without good soil. In fact, I agree with you 100%. In fact, here's a little uh, quote from a book that I'm reading called Hands-On Agronomy. Thank you, John, for giving me the book. It says that all you need to focus on as the provider for your turf is feeding the soil. If you feed the soil, then everything will work itself out. Yeah, it, it's true. Uh, there's, uh, Mother Nature has a way of, it will put certain weeds in the lawn, in the soils because it, of, of certain conditions like dandelions. Everybody goes, oh man, I hate dandelions. But you know what? I see that, I see a whole bunch of dandelions in a, uh, in a lawn and I can just tell right away. I'm like, you know what? That lawn's compacted. And if you think about the way the roots on a dandelion are, oh, yeah. they yeah. are like a carrot. You know, mm -hmm. when you pull a big one out, they are like, and those roots dry down, and what mm -hmm. they're doing is they're breaking open uh, the soil so that yep. it's like natural aeration in a sense, like coration, but in a different way. Because when those uh, dandelions, pat they die, it leaves a void. And then other things get in there. Yep. And the soil will heal itself. It may not grow what you want it to grow, but it will grow what it needs to grow in order to suck in as much uh, the, the micro and macronutrients as it needs to be healthy. I agree with you. Um, one more thing I would like to talk about while we're on the topic of uh, fall lawn seeding mm -hmm. is if you are going to do a total and complete kill, which sure. I might eventually take on just for content, um, stay tuned guys. Um, but anyway, when you, when you do that, how do you plot out your timetable so you know like when would you start your complete kill so that you can be ready for seeding? If we get enough heads up, it's it's kind of a terrifying thing because a lot of people when they go for this they don't really if they want their time schedule they're not going by Mother Nature's. Mm -hmm. But if we get a uh, about a month or so ahead of time, so like around Fourth of July, if I have clients that are kind of unhappy with their lawn because they just moved in or whatever and it's just a wreck. We'll, I'll send them out notifications saying, hey, you know, we, we, we could offer this. We could do it. Your lawn would actually fall on that parameter. If you're really not happy with it, we could do this. So generally, ballpark, Purdue University or over here, they recommend starting seeding between, um, I think they say prime time is like August 15th to September 15th, if I'm not mistaken. And that's about right. So if we were going to do a total kill, I would try to get the, depending on the soil temperatures and everything, I would try to get the kill in like right around that, that time period. Mm -hmm. Depending on how, if, if there's um, the moisture that's in the ground and everything. And the funny thing is, before you, the, to kill a lawn, the best way to kill a lawn is to make sure it's really watered well. So if we're in the middle of a drought, you're not going to get a, as good of a kill if, right. if you let it, you just sprayed it and didn't water it. If you water it and then go ahead and spray it, the grass and weeds and everything will take that in. Mm -hmm. And it takes, you know, about a week for, yeah, for 10 it to days. happen. You know, and sometimes it takes a second application mm -hmm. to, uh, to get that done. But generally, I would say like mid-August is when you would want to spray everything, get it knocked out, and that way you can come in. Do your slits. I do slice seeding, slit seeding. Um, I find that's pre you know, one of the best practices of getting that seed to quickly germinate. And since we're on the sh I'm on your time, mm -hmm. I still use the RGS yep. uh, and liquid aerate too. So um, I, I use some oh man, all competitors. 
just gonna know all my secrets now. No, it's all right. Uh, no, but uh, using that in, in conjunction with a uh, good starter fertilizer, and uh, mm-hmm. the most important thing is making sure that they keep a watering schedule. Follow. If, I, if anybody out there ends up hire, hiring myself or Jake, and we give you a piece of paper or a manual that says, "Okay, we've done all the hard work. Here you go." <laughs> but now, hang on a second. You have to promise you're going to follow this, right? That's right. It's a watering guide. That watering guide is like gold. It, it's, it's, it's the most important part. Like we could do, we will do all the hard work. All you got to do is make sure that that sprinkler system gets turned on. Yep. And then follow the watering procedure. It might seem like overkill at first, but you got to understand, you got to keep everything moist. It's not going to get saturated and dry or uh, soaked completely. We just want to keep everything moist and delicious right? <laughs> until everything starts yep. spreading or, and germinating. Once everything starts germinating, then we cut back on it and we start dialing it back until it's it's ready. But mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah, you definitely, if you're out there, the watering guide is the most important thing. I don't care if you got an in-ground sprinkler system or you have to go and drag a hose or whatever it is. Make sure you get enough water on that lawn. Otherwise, there's no point in doing it. Mm-hmm. it might, Mother Nature's not going to oh, yeah. provide enough. Don't trust Mother Nature. Now, I do. I do. Um, I actually do push uh, that fact that when you do it in the fall, you do have a little bit of leeway. But that doesn't mean that you can't take a couple of days off watering. Now, if you miss a day and you're watering manually, that's fine. But don't make a habit out of that, right? But it's important if you're la- if you're lazy. We could, there's, there's products out there that will help you, you know, adjust for your screw-ups. There's moisture, like Hydrotain is a yep. one that I think most people are familiar with. That is a, a, an agent that sits in your lawn and it will keep the water there. It'll literally pull the water it'll, in. Yeah, so that, you know, <laughs> if there's anything in the, in the atmosphere, it'll happen, like overnight when that dew point's hidden, it'll collect that dew and then help supplement your watering yep. schedule um, and another thing that you can do in conjunction with that especially all my homeowner friends out there is what I like to call the J irrigation system have you heard of this John I know I haven't yeah. I'm sorry so here real quick let me go ahead and catch John up for all those right. of you guys who have been watching me for a while you know what it is Aiden uh, my moderator sorry. here my moderator here, if you can, please link below the video I did all about it. It's like 12 minutes long. You, you know which one it is. Aiden's a buddy of mine. No, okay. kid I mentor. Hi. Um, yeah. So what it is, is it's, it's a timer and a set of four sprinklers that I get from Home Depot, specifically the Orbit sprinklers. Okay. Know, the Orbit oscillators, the rotators. The, the, you know, this is like a... I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> this, it's, it, I, 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 if people don't have a sprinkler system when they get a seeding job from us, I have these suitcase sprinklers that I got, and basically it's a suitcase manifold that I, I leave for them and I charge them a deposit for it, but then it has impact sprinklers, uh, so it sounds very similar to yeah. what you got there. Mm-hmm. Uh, the manifold's just kind of nice because it, it has the electric timers, and basically I just turn the water on and it. Yep. I have control over it, not them. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> so wait, does the uh, does that pump off of your trunk? Do you, do you have a water tank on the truck? Or? No, no, no. That comes off of their. It comes off their uh, uh, water spigot. So their hose bib. Uh, it 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 the there's a hose that goes from there to my uh, suitcase sprinkler mm-hmm. system, and basically inside that uh, suitcase there are four timers mm-hmm. for different times. And each one can control like basically like two zones. Really? So it's I can control, off of one box. I can control eight zones. So it's kind of a. It's not real pretty when you got all the the uh, when you got all the hoses strung out. But at the same time, it guarantees that nothing's going to go dry because I could do the front lawn, the side, and the back of a um, twelve thousand square foot lawn. And it will get complete coverage. That's that's very cool. I should have brought it. As a matter of fact, you know what? I'll have to come out one day, and we'll just have to do a video. Stop by my shop. It. Yeah, man. You'll, you know what? I got all my fun toys at the shop. So. Oh, you got a shop too. Well, nice. it's yeah. I call it the shop, but you know. 
it's, <laughs> it's not. Uh, it's it, it's it's very economical for me. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's a storage unit, but uh, I'm able to. You know. Yeah. Keep all the equipment there, and everything's nice and tidy, and it's separate from home life and business life. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's really cool. I would. Yeah, I would love to see that, but. For those who are looking to make their own system, his his is very nice too, especially for all the pros out there. But for those who uh, want to make their own system or who are undertaking their own lawns, I actually have a custom irrigation system that I made with a, uh, a four outlet timer that I put on the spigot, right? And then what I do is I run maybe four hoses out to all the corners of my little 2,000 mm -hmm. square foot plot here. And in every corner I have those little Oscillating orbit orbit, sprinklers. Yeah. What I what I like about those is that they they resemble the uh, rotor sprinklers that sure. pop up out of the ground. So I'll put those on the corners of my yard, and for the most part, one head at full pressure gives really good coverage. If mm -hmm. you leave it on for 45 minutes to an hour each one, and it's it's a, it's been a it's been a good asset for me because it keeps the lawn irrigated in the summer. I don't have to think about it, and on top of that aeration and overseeding when I'm really busy with say school jazz concerts all that um, I don't have to think one second about the watering it's being done for me based on the timer that I've set so nice little solution for those of my homeowner friends out there with a small area of land and no irrigation system so your, your system sounds just like mine mm -hmm. so it's not like you know it's 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 not like I reinvented the wheel. I just made, I just made a sound <laughs> yeah. His His is probably exact. Exa I'm sorry I didn't watch the, 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 the sprinklers. No, that's all good. You know, I'll, thing. I'll share it with you. I'll, 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 I'll go back on the YouTube. That's what's nice. You can always check yeah. back on everything. But, uh, yeah, for the most part, it's, uh, it's very cool because it's a nice way to uh, stick up. It's, it's really a great way to keep up on the watering without having to think about it. And that's the idea here. So we're just trying to make life for those who don't have an irrigation system much easier as you you get the uh, same product as an irrigation system without the without spending the extra time and the extra labor of installing an actual irrigation system. I'll tell you what, for the, for you residential folks that are homeowners uh, and you're building a new place, just it, it doesn't cost very much more money to get a sprinkler system installed when the builders do your home. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, it's cheaper to get it installed when they're building your home than it is to come back and retrofit. So like for your home, it would cost more for them to come and install it now than mm -hmm. is if the house was built with it installed. So I know this doesn't apply to everybody, but just for those that might be out there and they're either switching homes or getting a new home built, it's, it's really only a couple thousand dollars extra at that time to get it installed and they work out all the bugs it's nice it's nice to have it like you got like when they're still building your house and there's no drywall or anything and they and they have all access to all your watering and everything it that, that's the time to get it installed because they can hack into it however they need to make it look right do right get into your lawn because most lawns under construction are still all just clay there's nothing there anyway yeah uh, they could put it at the proper depth they're not going to um, they're not gonna be putting it shallow like a lot of installers kind of do right now um, I've run into that issue when we do some core aeration and this the it was not uh, the system wasn't installed properly and it was too shallow and all mm -hmm. of a sudden we're each chewing up a line you know 15 feet of line and it's like oh, you signed the thing <laughs> you signed it it says like we're not responsible for that because it's supposed to be like at least three you know under more than three inches deep to to uh, you know be properly installed some of these things right. it's like it's right underneath the turret the facade mm -hmm. i'm like how did you who did this but my quick, my long tip. That's not a quick tip. That was. <laughs> I'm sorry. I can't be very concise sometimes. I get all long-winded about small things. No, it's actually good because that makes the video longer. Ad revenue. So thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> it's like 
Ten other dollars? Yeah. Hey, there you go. Twenty five bucks right there. <laughs> yep. Anybody else need to make some money? I could talk all night. Come on now. <laughs> uh, that's great. We got any more questions coming up in there? Yeah, Matt McGurian. So Matt's actually another fellow Hoosier lives right up the street, did a reno this fall. Okay. Um, has a question here about his reno. He says, I renoed 7,500 square feet with a Harley rake. Um, I actually don't know what that is. A Harley rake's an awesome tool. Okay. It's basically a, uh, it's a, uh, ugh. this would go either on a skid steer or like a dingo or something like that. Mm -hmm. they, they make them in different sizes, but what it is is it is a long roller bar with big nubs on it and what it does is it pulverizes the earth and what you can do is when you drag it you drag it back and it'll lay out the, 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 the soil very evenly it'll remove all big stones and everything mm -hmm. for you too it's a great tool love it I think I think I know what you're talking about now because I actually demoed one uh, at the Ventrac team oh, Ventrac's got one it's, yeah it, they don't call it a Harley rake they call it a um, power rake uh, it's uh, they call it something else. It is a um, aerator power rake. It's not the aerator, but I can't remember what the 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 Ventrac attachment is called. But it's it's essentially a power yeah, rake. Yeah, it's the same thing. Yeah. Um. But yeah, it's so. What was his question? He Harley raked it. Yeah, he said I sowed October sixth. Okay. Um. With pe with perennial ryegrass, it didn't take as well as I wanted to. Mm -hmm. I plan on overseeding in the spring. Would KBG take over or just continue with uh, ryegrass? I would, personally, I would take put the Kentucky Blue in there. Um, perennial rye is a great grass for quick germination. You could have mm -hmm. within three, four, five, six, seven days, it'll start germinating and popping out. I mean, I use an 80-20 mix of grass, which is 80% uh, Kentucky Blue and 20% perennial rye. The perennial rye is just to kind of show that it's working <laughs> because it'll pop up within a week, whereas the Kentucky Blue might take two to three weeks to start showing. Um, and it all depends on the soil temperatures. I can't remember what the soil temps were in October, early October, but I think they were getting, they're still warm enough, but you were getting on the back end of it. Um, give it some time. Uh, if your mix had Kentucky Bluegrass in it, I would kind of see if that I probably won't if it did or uh, it's probably not going to germinate now I'm pretty sure it won't <laughs> <laughs> but if you were going to go with Kentucky Blue wait until next fall again because like we said before the uh, germination spring germination rates are not yeah, you're, you're spending a lot of money on Kentucky Blue and it could it, it could just be throwing money into the wind. Mm -hmm. um, I would follow the, just keep feeding it properly, you know, spot spray when you need to. Mm -hmm. Things should be filling in. It all depends on how much germination you actually had from your perennial rye. Um, if you need, to, if you just need to fill in bare spots and you got leftover perennial rye, keep spreading that out. It, it's, it's okay. It's not going to kill it. And the great thing about perennial rye and Kentucky bluegrass is that they are very. They look very similar, in most cases. So they complement each other. So if you had a, if you start doing the overseeding with Kentucky Blue in the fall, it's going to that those two grass types are going to complement each other. They're going to match each other kind of nicely, mm -hmm. and that Kentucky Blue will eventually push out and take over that perennial rye yep. because it's just going to start spreading all over. See, one of the things that I like about bluegrass is kind of like you said. It's more of the uh, it's more of the base, right? It's the footing that supports everything. And if there's one thing I like about bluegrass is that when you care for it properly and you keep overseeding with it year after year after year, you can get a really thick lawn because of the way it grows. True. You have to be careful with overseeding Kentucky Blue too much mm. because the f you can start choking itself out. It'll it'll compete with itself, and then it it'll it's like yeah. a civil war. It'll be like, all right, I'm going to kill myself. And that's not you don't want that right um, if when folks overseed with uh, perennial rye and tall fescue like we said before those are bunch type grasses so they only they'll have like a bunch this big and it looks like plugs all over the place mm -hmm. if and they're not going to fill in those gaps in between the plugs mm -hmm. but with Kentucky blue you could 
that's why the application rates are so low. You only it, there's a couple reasons for that. One, the the Kentucky bluegrass scene is very very small, and there's a ton more of them per pound than there yeah. are tall fest or perennial rye. The other part is spreading it because it, it's rhizomatic. It, it, it it's a rhizomatous. Why can't I say that word right now? It will spread itself out and it will fill itself in. It's going to throw these little. You're going to get these little guys runners on top and on the bottom of the below the soil, and they're going to pop back up and they're going to be like, hey. This is the same plant, but we're over here. Now we're yeah. over here. Look at that. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Yep. So, uh, yeah, just just be careful with Kentucky Blue about overseeding it too much. Like a lot of people say, oh, yeah, you've got to overseed every single year. I'm like, pump the brakes a little. <laughs> That's only that. The, I have a, I have one uh, client in particular that always comes to mind. He, he always wants it overseeded every single year. And he's had a, he's had a terrible problem with fungus. And mostly because his his canopy is so thick, mm -hmm. because the previous company kept overseeding it all the time, and his canopy was so thick it couldn't breathe, and he would just get fowler spot, and he even had brown patch at one point in time, mm -hmm. which up here that's I mean it's we get it, but it's not as common as you know dollar spot is for right. us. So it, it caused him more problems, and it cost him more money, because now. It's part of his regular regime now. We have to put down fungicide to control. We can't eliminate it, but just to control the fun the fungus that's popping up in his lawn. It, we have to just go. Oh, it's starting to pop up, and here we go. We're hitting the, the applications to just stop it in its tracks and keep it from spreading. Mm -hmm. So, absolutely, um, because the reason I said that earlier though is because I'm just saying if you wanted to get a good footing oh yeah yeah I I, I apologize not to no I understand yeah. I understand where you're coming from I, mean, I actually appreciate that but I'm just saying if you're if you're dealing with bare ground bluegrass is really good and then if you care for it properly like a lot of people in our community actually mow it like really low yeah like a quarter of an inch I don't like it I I mean it you can make it look really good but mm -hmm. for uh, in order to keep it looking really good at oh, yeah. that at that height, you have to water it, and it's not a it's not like oh I can water it every three days. It's a constant thing, and most people can't afford it. Look I at mean, Connor Ward. I know <laughs> Connor. Yeah, Connor's got. I mean, he's out in uh, or, or Utah. Here? Utah. Utah. Sorry, I knew it was over there. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, his oh, man, his lawns. He. I think I remember. Uh, when we were at Lyoncology yeah, last year, yeah. um, we were talking with him, and I'm like, I, you're the guy that leveled your lawn, right? And he's like, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, man, I, 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 I really like what you did there. But, man, I've had people asking me to do that for them, and then they're, they want me to cut their lawn that low, and I'm like, I can't do that. <laughs> like, I could, but it's, I'm like, I don't think you're going to like the price because it's we have to be out here like every other day just to mow your lawn yep. <laughs> and then the water bill is going to be ridiculous they 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 want like they want like golden corral you know pricing with uh <laughs> you know gino steakhouse yep. you know quality or what's that other place the the good steakhouse we got around prime there. i don't know there's a lot of them actually there's there's a new one I don't know how far do you go? Do you go? Are you mostly in Crown Point, St. John? I'm St. John, St. John, and uh, Cherville mm -hmm. is okay. kind of where I, I hang out. There's a new one that actually popped up down the street here. Remember the Dick's bref breakfast joint? Yeah, all yeah, way yeah, down there. That's a that's a new steakhouse now. I don't know the name of it. I, it's been a while since I've been there, but they got a nice steak right by two thirty one or yeah. forty one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That place changed hands really quick. Mm -hmm. They used to be like a breakfast joint and yeah. everything, but now they're more of a dinner steak place. Yeah. But uh, yeah, they got works. But yeah, yeah, Connor Ward and his uh, super low mo. It's a beautiful lawn. It's but it takes a lot of effort and a lot of work oh, yeah. to keep it looking great. And I tell that to everybody. Like I understand, it looks good. Like a lot of people. What am I? <clears throat> what? Sorry. So let me go ahead and start over there. I did, so I did a walk and talk video about a year and a half ago where I just walked around my neighborhood, and one thing I talked about in 
uh, contra in contradiction with everything that we just talked about about mm -hmm. the low mowed lawn, is that the biggest problem around here is that people are mowing way too low, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And people are telling me, Jake, well, what about Connor Ward? His lawn is beautiful. And I'm like, yes, I understand that. But what you guys are thinking about is the amount of time and the amount of work and commitment that he puts into it. He literally mows his lawn every single day. He has right? to. After work, out there mowing it. And that's fine. That's what he commits to. But if you're mowing your lawn at an inch at an inch uh, inch worth of height or lower than that, because you're you're what you're doing is you're taking well, you could. What happens is when you let a lawn go for a while, the actual crowns could actually come up off the ground a little bit more, and if you hit that crown by cutting it too low, you say let's say you had a foot tall lawn. <laughs> You're like, I'm going to shave this thing down. Yeah. Well, yeah, for one, you're taking more than a third off. And most people are like, what? Third, the, the third, one third rule of, of trimming. You know, that's just something we always say to everybody. And I break the rule occasionally, too, because you have to when it's it's growing like crazy. Sometimes we, we're taking off almost half. But, we're, but we maintain our lawns between three and a half and four inches. Um, but in the springtime, it's crazy. Anyway. Getting back to my point is, if you're doing it like every two weeks, if you're mowing your lawn every two weeks and you want that scalp look, <laughs> you're just not going to have a good looking lawn because like I said, it's going to traumatize the lawn so bad that it's going to brown out, it's going to just look bad, it's not going to have that healthy green look to it. The crowns are actually going to kind of come up off the ground a little bit and if you cut it that low, you can ding those crowns. When you ding the crown, that's when you do serious damage to your lawn. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> uh, I Personally, my company, we cut between three and a half and four inches, and we maintain that height throughout the entire season. And the only time that we drop the height, the cut of height, is during this time of the year because it's not growing as much, and we want to make prep that lawn uh, so that it doesn't acquire or it doesn't develop snow mold um, over the because we're going to have snow sitting on top of our grass for a long time and if you have a, a lot of grass that's laid over all that stuff right here, right here up underneath here is a perfect breeding ground for that fungus it thrives in the cold yep. and it loves that cover because it's like not completely frozen it's just hanging out and it can spread throughout the entire canopy um, so yeah, that's the only reason why we chop it a little lower in the fall, and, mm -hmm. but we don't scalp, I don't, personally, I, I don't recommend people scalping cool season grass ever. Nope. Uh, <laughs> like some people, oh, you gotta scalp it. Down south, that's something that they do. They scalp lawns. I don't, uh, you know, I, I understand that that works for that type of, uh, of turf, but up here in northwest Indiana and Basically, if you go north, or excuse me, east and west, and keep at that same plane, it's kind of like anybody coast to coast. Basically, we have right. that same type of region. Uh, Matt McGurian, again, that's our fellow Hoochie okay. on the street, um, wants to know, John, what is your favorite mower and why? What is your preferred mower? Oh, I have, man, that is a tough question. I like, what, what are we talking commercial? Just commercial lawns or commercial mowers? Yeah, commercial. Man, that is that's a trick question in a sense because there's a lot of. I, I'll tell you what, most of the big brands are going to be great for what you want it to do. Okay, uh, I've run Skags, Wrights, Toros. Um, what else? They, they, there's a laundry list of, of companies that we've used. Um, currently, we're running Skaggs, uh, the V Rides. They're good mowers. Uh, I prefer now the. We had rights before. I like the rights now again. There, there's some things that uh, they just overbuild those things. Yeah. And for our grass type, uh, what's going to matter more is like, kind of like the. It's, it's good. What's going to matter more with the cut quality is the the deck itself. Toros will give you great um, cut quality. 
some of their equipment though I have had issues with in the past and I have a lot of friends that run their stuff and they've had some mechanical issues most of it has always been covered by the warranty so it's kind of a it's hard for me to tell anybody like one specific brand my best advice that I could give you is look at your local dealer when you're dealing with commercial equipment find out how the support is there luckily we got turf strips. oh I love turf strips, dude. we got turf strips. Here's a free plug for them. Mm. I but love them. They carry Skag, right and Toro. You can't go wrong yeah. with that. Okay. <laughs> Not only that, but for professionals, I don't know how it is with homeowners, but because we, this is how we make a living, and we support them, so they they will, you know, reciprocate and they support us. Uh, I have an excellent relationship with pretty much everybody at the at the place. When I bring a machine in, they will get it back to me very quickly. If they don't have the part, not that I could get a loaner all the time, but I can just say, hey, if it's going to be more than a few days and you don't have the part, I need I need to replace this machine, and they'll work with me on that. Never had to, it's never come down to that because they've always been very quick with the turnover on repairs. If I don't do it myself, they could do it. Um, so it's not exactly the brand, per se, of mower. I would stick with like the, the well-known brands because they have their stuff wired together. Wright's got their man. I'll tell you what. The I, I talk to Ed all the time and like <laughs> the machines. I'm like, hey, what what do you guys use for the mounting hardware for your your wheel motors? And he's telling me, and I'm like, it's a specially hardened steel from Germany. I'm like, God, I knew I should stick with you guys, you know. <laughs> um, but anyway, that long story short. It's not exactly the the brand. It's going to be your. It's going to come down to your dealer support, and whatever machine doesn't keep breaking down on you. That's right. So I'll leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's a great one because it's a common question that comes up a lot for me. Like people often ask me, Jake, what is the best commercial mower for my business? Mm -hmm. I'm like, dude, I have no freaking idea. I don't. It, I haven't owned one yet. And it, and it, here's the thing too, like you know, that is a super broad question because it could be you, your business model also depends on this too. So if you're attacking very small lots, you may not even need a right-on mower or whatever. Mm -hmm. You might do better with like a 30-inch commercial mower or 21, like Honda's 21-inch are, are those things. I love them. They're cheap enough to where you know we could get rid of them once a year if we needed to. Mm -hmm. In my but my business model, we don't use any walk behind, push behind. We don't have. I don't even have a twenty one inch mower anymore. Right. Because if I can't get a thirty six on it, we don't take the job. Mm -hmm. And almost I, there's because of the towns that I work in. Um, oh, every single lot I could think of can accommodate a 36 inch mower. Uh, we run 36 and 52 inch mowers mainly because of the compatibility with the blades. A 36 inch blade will fit on a 52 vice versa and a lot of when you're going for a, uh, a commercial mower too, don't mix and match. Okay, mm -hmm. Stick with one brand because there's a lot of compatibility like the, the oil filters and things like that for each of those machines they may cross over. If the, if those parts don't cross over because it's different engine manufacturers, then like spindles and uh, wheel bearings and things like that, those do cross over. And most of the time, I only have to keep one thing in stock. Like if I were to keep a spindle in stock, I'd only have to buy one type of spindle and I could replace it on any of the machines we have. So that's also another thing to think about, parts compatibility. Explicit, like your name, buddy. <laughs> Explicit wants to know, and I think this is a great one for uh, anybody who's starting their own spray business. Um, how many sprayers do you recommend owning? I've heard of people getting multiple sprayers for different stuff. One for fertilizer, one for herbicide, great classification there, one for insecticide, etc. Sure. Uh, on my truck, we have six sprayers. Uh, the, the backpack sprayers, and that does not include the ride-on machine or the uh, hose, but 
we we have different mixes for different things. There's so starting out, I would have I would probably have three minimum, and they don't all have to be backpack sprayers because we don't uh, with with our fertilizer we do granular. We don't spray any uh, liquid fertilizer at this time. I spray RGS and I'll spray uh, aerate and liquid dethatch, but I don't spray uh, fertilizer straight. So if you're just starting out, I would recommend having a backpack sprayer that's going to do most of the work for you. So if you're mixing, say, like a three way or whatever um, broadleaf herbicide, uh, have that on, you know, so that you walk around and spot spray everything and then have maybe two hand cans that have specialty in them. One could mark them and permanently mark them. If you, When you come and see my shop, you'll see what I'm talking okay. about. Everything has a tag on it. Like the backpack sprayers, instead of marking with uh, a permanent marker on each one, it will have a tag on it stating like this is for a specific type of herbicide or like say like a three-way or whatever. That way, you could keep that off of one type of chemical. Mm -hmm. You could say, okay, this three-way and this four-way product are very similar. They have, you know, very similar aspects. So when I wash that thing out, I could still use it within this. I don't use uh, this uh, herbicide tank mixed with a fungicide. And you can do it. It's not problematic, but we generally kind of keep things a little bit separate so that um, your fungicides your and some of your higher end uh, herbicides like say if you're um, say if you got like a lot of sedge you know you got yellow nut sedge in the lawn you I, I for those things we have one gallon hand cans because it's easier to maintain that one little gallon we're not cross mixing it we're not making like crazy Okay, I'm going to mix this with crab. I have done it before, where you put like crabgrass control yep. and nuts edge together, uh, nuts edge control together. But I find it's a lot easier just to have it, and we could itemize. We could be like, okay, we're going to grab this one and this one, and that's going to take care of all the problems in the lawn. Because when you start mixing whole tanks and you start putting everything in it, and it's not your own lawn, you're you're doing it professionally. Not everybody's lawn is going to need all those things, and there's I'm a big advocate of not putting down unnecessary uh, applications. At, um, so if it doesn't need nut sedge control, why apply it? Not only is it irresponsible use of the chemical, but it is also a cost to me that I don't want to have to pass on to my client. Mm -hmm. You know, absolutely. So yeah, long story short. I'd say at least have three, one big, one main backpack, and then two hand cans for special for specialties, gotcha. and then that should that should get you rolling. Okay, um, we'll take one more question, and then because we're past seven o'clock, that what? Be, yeah. My goodness, it went by quick, didn't it? Yeah, man. I just talk way too much. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is a great one. I love talking about next. So. Um, Explicit says, I got a next question. Are there still benefits to spraying humic, RGS, and aerate during the off-season as long as the ground isn't frozen? Which I totally advocate. I want to hear your input on this. As long as the ground's not frozen and you're not going to have any kind of runoff mm -hmm. on it, I would I would say go ahead. It, it, you want to make sure that you're putting down what your lawn needs. So I would recommend getting... if I'm, Getting soil tests, I don't know if you advocate that as much. Oh, I advocate They're, it a lot. Okay. It's like you, once you know what your lawn needs specifically, once you take a proper soil test and get that, get the results back, you can dial in your, um, dial in your program so that you know exactly what it needs. You, you know what the inputs it needs. If a lot of times over the winter, I wouldn't, we don't really we generally don't do any applications because it's too cold up here. The ground at this point has warmed up a little bit more, but within the next week, it's going to be probably what the key things know are to know what does your lawn need? Is it 
a good time to put it down. If it's going to be, is it frozen? If it's mm -hmm. frozen, do not put it down. Just, it's not going to help anything. It's not going to be taken in full by with the foliage. It's not going to be taken in with the soil. It will sit at the top, and there's a huge chance of runoff at that point. And we don't want that. We don't want it. We want it to go where we want it to be instead of having that chance of sitting at the top of the soil and then, hey, it starts to thaw out. It's not going to go in the soil right away. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen is that Absolutely. lower level is going to be still be frozen, and then if it snow melts or rain comes in, it's going to wash that off, and it's going to end up in the storm sewers. Right. Don't want to do that. So to add on to that, absolutely, dude, go ahead and put those products down. Yeah. They're only going to help. Like, that's all John talks about. John even tells us in all of his videos, he's like, hey, man, don't overthink these. They're only going to help. Put them yeah. down in the off season. Especially, that's why they call these specialties, right? You can use them whenever, especially the Humic 12. I highly advocate um, putting that down every other week here in the winter when the soil's uh, soft and malleable, like uh, John talked about here. Uh, because it's a great way to help build the soil up for next year, get some humic in there to chelate that soil and get it ready for next spring to start absorbing those nutrients more efficiently. So, John, I want to thank you so much for having me, hey. for coming on to the show. I really appreciate no you taking the time. Uh, real quick, for those who are curious, where can people find you? I am on Facebook. I do have a YouTube channel, but it's old and doesn't have very much content on it. But uh, John Pajak is the, uh, you could, if you're looking for me personally, that's where you can find me on Facebook. Uh, Turf Table Lawn Care, I've got a website, you can check that out, turftablelawncare.com. And uh, if you want to look at some old, ah, we won't even talk about the YouTube. <laughs> next time I come on the show, maybe I'll have a better YouTube Hey, maybe the next out. time he comes on the show, um, that'll be after three months of me getting on him to make content. Yeah, I'll have to make some content. <laughs> All right, well, uh, uh, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and end the show here. I hope you guys enjoyed it, and if you did, please be sure to subscribe to the channel, and I'll show you how to get the deepest, darkest, greenest, thickest lawn on the block. With that, I'm Jake the Lawn Kid. Thank you for watching. We will see you guys next time. If I don't see you guys next time, your lawn is going to be dominated. See you later. Keep pushing through. Yeah. Oh, I trust you! <laughs> All right. Cut this off. Bye, Claire. Goodbye. <laughs> Bye.